Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture on computer architecture. Today I want to talk to you about uh, quantum computing, something that is, uh, well, not state of the art, it is more like beyond state of the art, it is into um, still in the development uh, phase. So it's not even clear if it's going to work. But let me try to explain to you what is going on and why it would be phenomenal if it really works. So the first thing I want to actually, uh, I want to tell you what it is actually based on. What do we have is um, that in a normal computer we have let's say an end gate in which every bit there it enters and it has the bit can have two values. It's either uh, one or it is zero. And that is then linked to a physical property. So for instance, the zero is zero volt and uh, the one is five volts. Or maybe uh, the zero is that the uh, capacitor is charged and uh, one is that the uh, capacitor is empty or the other way around, uh, whatever. But with quantum computing, there is something strange going on. Because the bits that we put at the input cannot have uh, uh, either one of the two values, but it can have two values at the same time. And that is something very strange, but that comes from uh, quantum mechanics. So the idea is that you have an object of physical property that can have various uh, states. Uh, so we can, for instance, take here um, the classic example is that you can have here an electron spin. And as you know, well, or maybe not, but the electron spin, it can either rotate in one direction, let's say here counterclockwise, or this is, this is clockwise, and the other one would be counterclockwise. And we could, for instance, say, well, we can just say that uh, counterclockwise would be uh, zero and clockwise would be one. So maybe we call this one here on the left, we call it uh, then um, one and the other one on the right, uh, we call it a zero. And then we're going to make some kind of, uh, they arrive at our end gate and we're going to do some kind of, um, well, Boolean logic with that. But the thing is that in quantum mechanics, the electron state is uh, not defined, spin up or spin down, is not defined until it is measured. And it is not so that uh, the uh, state of the spin is not known to us, but it is a certain state. It is uh, up or down, but only it's not observed by me. Uh, no, that would be classical uh, mechanics, classical physics. But in quantum physics, it is like this, that no, the state is not defined until it is measured, until it is so-called uh, observed. So then, before you observe it, it is like, you know, Mr. Um, Schrödinger's cat. It is both, uh, the cat of Mr. Uh, Schrödinger was both dead, dead and alive at the same time. In the same time, the same way, the spin of the electron is both up and down at the same time. And that means that uh, only when we start observing it, then the spin, so-called, uh, the wave function as we call it, it collapses. So only when we observe it, the spin becomes uh, up or uh, down. And if you think this concept is uh, strange, I would like to remind you of uh, Mr. Um, the famous uh, talk of Mr. Feynman, uh, where he said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. And this is how weird actually it is. You can make these weird uh, phrases and actually uh, being right on top. I really recommend you to watch, if you're interested into these kind of things, the lecture series of Mr. Richard Feynman. It's in black and white, very old fashioned, but the quality I think has not been surpassed by any, uh, uh, any person from physics uh, since that time. So these black and white videos are perfect. And there he says, I think the lectures are called the character of physical nature or something like this. But anyway, there he says, nobody understands quantum mechanics. And that is Mr. F uh, Feynman uh, saying that. So in quantum mechanics, the state is not defined until we observe it. And until the time the state is in a, the wave function is in a superposition state. So it is both spin up and spin down at the same time when we use electrons. So how can we use this now to make a quantum computer? Well, we take these uh, two things. So uh, I, let me put it back here. Let me say it like this. So we have generally, we have a wave function 
that uh, that uh, a bit a at the entrance of our gate, it would be both uh, in the spin up and the spin down state because we didn't observe it yet. But we're all already going to do calculations with this wave function before observing it. So we apply the wave function to our gate and then we are doing simultaneously the calculations with the spin up state as well as the spin down state. So one bit of information, actually I should say this, one bit arriving at your gate actually has two bits of um, processing information. Now how does we then uh, do this? If we take two bits, then we have four calculations doing at the same time. And if we have 100 bits, then we do 2 to the power 100 calculations at the same time because we didn't collapse the wave function yet. And to give you an idea then, just a simple computer of uh, 100 bits, so maybe we would have something like this. I think this is the uh, IBM uh, quantum computing uh, machine. And you can see, well, it's quite complex. Uh, maybe this has 100 bits. I guess this entire thing has to be cooled down to liquid helium or something mm -hmm. like this, because it looks to me that this one will be embedded into uh, into some kind of cooling uh, vessel uh, because of this. You can see this uh, thermal shields that are there and then the electronic wires that come here through here and through loops so that uh, the thermal conductivity is not so high. And here at the bottom, then the calculation is done at very low temperature because then you have apparently you can do this quantum states. Well, you can imagine that this uh, thing must cost a fortune. But if you have 100 bits, then you can do 2 to the power 100 uh, calculations in simultaneous, uh, simultaneously. And to give you an idea, that is about 2 to the power 100 is about 10 to the power 30. So uh, if you do one calculation per second, effectively you're doing 10 to the power 30 uh, calculations uh, per second. And that is then about 10 to the power 20, 10 gigahertz cores in parallel. So you can get the idea as if you have 10 to the power 20 uh, very strong computers working uh, in, uh, in parallel. I don't think that there are so many computers in the world. And actually in the, uh, this would be, it's like astronomical amounts of processing power if you just have 100 bits. To be honest, uh, I'm quite skeptical, but I'm just explaining to you how it works. To be honest, I'm quite skeptical because ob obviously uh, nature didn't do this and, uh, and the advantages would be very well in nature. Imagine that you're um, a lion or uh, actually or you're, you're the prey of the lion. It would be if you have such cal calculating power in your brain or uh, somehow then of course you would be able to predict, let's say the future for the next uh, one or two hours uh, with high precision. So you could be able to either avoid the lion or as when you're the lion, you could easily uh, uh, catch your prey. So I'm very skeptical that it works, but this is the principle of, um, of uh, how it works. So that is quantum computing. It might be that this will then be the end of uh, um, things like Bitcoin or uh, blockchain in general, cryptography, because you can instantly calculate all the possible uh, cryptographic possibilities. So decrypting is actually then a piece of cake. So see you in the next lecture where I will talk about uh, a clockless computer. So I will actually talk about your brain, which doesn't have a clock, as you know. See you in the next lecture.